This screencast discusses the repair of a fracture and calcium homeostasis. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Define a bone fracture. Contrast a simple and compound fracture. Identify several common fractures. Describe the repair of a fracture. Explain the importance of calcium homeostasis. Describe the role of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone in maintaining calcium homeostasis. And finally, describe the causes and signs of rickets and osteoporosis. A fracture is simply a break in a bone. Fractures can be closed or simple where the bone does not penetrate the skin, or the fracture can be open or compound where the bone does penetrate the skin. Fractures are treated by reduction where the bones are realigned and put back into their normal positions, and then immobilization where the bones are held in place to allow the normal healing processes to begin and replace the bone tissue that was destroyed. Common fractures are listed here. You are responsible to for being able to identify these fractures. A comminuted fracture is one where the bone breaks into many fragments. This is common in individuals with brittle bones such as the elderly. In a compressed fracture, the bone is crushed. This is also common in elderly patients. In a depressed fracture, the bone is pushed inward. This is typical of a skull fracture. In an impacted fracture, one bone is pushed into the end of another bone. This can happen when one stretches one's arms out to brace or break your fall. And as that happens, the head of the humerus can be shoved into the glenoid fossa of the scapula. In a spiral fracture, excessive twisting breaks the bone. This is common in sports injuries. And lastly, a green stick fracture is an incomplete break of a bone. Uh, the, it gets its name from the way that a green twig uh, incompletely breaks. Again, be able to identify these fractures if you were given a description of them, such as on a multiple choice test. I will not give you a fill in the blank or something of that nature. You will have the names of these fractures available, and you'll simply uh, need to be able to. Uh, match the descriptions with the names. Let's now describe the process that occurs in the repair of a fracture. So when a bone is broken, blood vessels are severed. Recall that bone is well supplied with blood vessels. The severing of blood vessels causes blood to hemorrhage into, into the area of the break that causes the formation of a blood clot or hematoma and nearby bone, now without a supply of oxygen, dies close to the break. After about one week has passed, the repair process is well underway. Granulation tissue forms. Granulation tissue is basically a mixture of the extracellular components of bone. So there's the formation of collagen fibers and there is some ossification. The mixture of granulation tissue and ossification forms what is called a soft callus. The soft callus does help to splinter the break, but it cannot bear weight. Ossification continues such that after about a month, new bone has replaced a large portion of the granulation tissue such that now we have the formation of a bony callus. 
there is enough new bone to support some weight. After a number of months have passed, the granulation tissue is completely replaced with bone tissue. The individual now has use of the part of the body that was damaged again. So now the normal stresses due to physical activity are returned to the bone. And so the bone is going to remodel itself accordingly. Excess spongy bone and the bony callus are going to be reabsorbed and replaced by compact bone. Sometimes this process is so complete that it is not possible to tell that a fracture ever occurred. Other times there are remnants of the bony callus that remain and upon x-ray it is possible to tell that a fracture occurred. Calcium homeostasis refers to maintaining the calcium levels of blood in the normal range. Calcium homeostasis is very important because calcium is involved in blood clotting. It is also involved in the generation of nerve impulses by neurons. And it is involved in the contraction of muscles, including cardiac muscles of the heart. 99% of the body's calcium is stored in bone. So the skeletal system serves as a calcium bank for maintaining calcium homeostasis. Blood calcium is maintained by controlling the rate of calcium released from bone as it is resorbed by the osteoclasts and the amount of calcium that is removed from the blood and deposited in bone by the osteoblasts. The principal hormones that control those two processes are vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. Vitamin D is consumed in the food that we eat or it is made in the skin when skin is exposed to ultraviolet light. It is then converted to a more active form by the kidneys. Vitamin D increases absorption from the intestine, the absorption of calcium from the intestine, and thereby increases blood calcium levels, making the calcium available for bone deposition. Parathyroid hormone is released by the parathyroid gland in response to low blood calcium levels. Parathyroid glands are located on and around the thyroid gland, which is found in the neck. Parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium levels by increasing the resorption of bone by osteoclasts, and it also reduces the amount of calcium that is lost from blood into the urine. So to summarize the effects of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone on blood calcium levels, let's look at this figure from your book. Vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium from the intestines, thereby increasing blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone released from the parathyroid glands of the neck activate osteoclasts, increasing bone resorption, releasing calcium from the bone, and thereby increasing blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone also decreases the amount of calcium excreted in the urine or increases calcium retention by the kidneys, also serving to maintain blood calcium levels. Rickets is a disease in children where the bones fail to fully calcify due to insufficient vitamin D. In some cases, rickets can result from a calcium deficiency but more likely it is a vitamin D deficiency. Calcium absorption from the intestinal tract is very dependent on vitamin D. Even if one consumes enough calcium, if one has a vitamin D deficiency, uh, they will not be able to absorb that calcium from the intestinal tract. A vitamin D deficiency therefore results in poor ossification of bones of the lower appendages, 
Therefore, the bones of the lower appendages cannot bear the weight of the upper body, and they take on a bowing conformation, as shown in this figure. Rickets is rarely seen in more developed countries like the United States due to the fortification of food products like milk with vitamin D. You are more likely to see rickets in a less developed country where uh, food is not fortified with vitamins. Osteoporosis is a disease of adults due to excessive loss of bone density. Usually it occurs after menopause in women due to a drop in estrogen levels, although about 10% of osteoporosis victims are men. Osteoporosis literally means porous bone. And this is because excessive bone resorption over a period of time uh, leads to a loss of bone density, particularly in spongy bone, resulting in abnormally large spaces in the spongy bone. The reduction in bone density, as shown in the figure on the right, makes the bones quite fragile and subject to uh, fracture just from normal activities. The demographic that is most at risk for osteoporosis in the United States are Caucasian women. To decrease your risk of osteoporosis, it is very important that prior to menopause, uh, one gets adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D. One maintains a very active lifestyle. The more exercise and stress you put on your bones, the more bone deposition occurs. And if one smokes, it would also be advantageous to stop smoking. Smoking increases bone resorption. At the beginning of the chapter, you were introduced to a case study of Maggie H. Maggie H. was a 57-year-old grandmother who maintained a very active lifestyle. One day while running, she fell and suffered several fractures. Upon seeking medical treatment, she was diagnosed with osteoporosis. It was also found that her blood calcium levels and parathyroid hormone levels were elevated due to a parathyroid gland tumor. So that parathyroid gland tumor was releasing excessive levels of parathyroid hormone. The elevated levels of parathyroid hormone were basically putting Maggie's osteoclasts on overdrive, so they were excessively resorbing bone. This was responsible for the osteoporosis and the abnormally weak bones. It was also responsible for the elevation in calcium because as she, uh, as the osteoclasts were resorbing bone and releasing all that calcium into the blood under the influence of the parathyroid hormone, the parathyroid hormone was also preventing the kidneys from excreting the, uh, the calcium. So that caused elevation in blood calcium levels. Once the tumor was removed, the calcium levels returned to normal. Um, she also had complained of muscle weakness, and the muscle weakness went away, and that was due to the calcium levels returning to normal. The bone damage, however, could not be reversed. For the most part, once you lose bone density, it is very difficult to reverse it, at least to any significant amount uh, or degree. That's why it's so important prior to menopause that uh, one does whatever one can to maximize bone density. Now let's review the list of objectives that this screencast was designed to help you achieve. Define a bone fracture. Contrast a simple and compound fracture. Identify several common fractures. Describe the repair of a fracture. Explain the importance of calcium homeostasis. Describe the role of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone in maintaining calcium homeostasis. And finally, describe the causes and signs of rickets and osteoporosis.
The topic of the next screencast will be joints.